Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. And thank you so much to the Asian Medical Students uh, Association for inviting me to be here at this very international and exciting event. Uh, my name is Jose Siri. Uh, I lead our work at UNUIGH on, on urban health, on systems thinking for urban health. Uh, so we think about how cities uh, impact uh, people's health and well-being. And I'll talk a little bit today about the emerging threat of multi-drug resistant organisms and how that relates to our own research. Now, we take antibiotics uh, very much for granted these days. Uh, of course, we still have far too many preventable deaths and illness from communicable diseases, but nobody expects to die from a simple infection. And we routinely conduct complex surgeries that require uh, antibiotic therapy. Um, but though we've been using natural products with antibiotic properties for probably as long as we've been human beings, uh, antibiotics as clinical therapeutic agents uh, have been around just for a sliver of human history. Uh, just in that little space right there. Uh, there are very possibly people in this audience, or if not the grandparents of people in this audience, who remember the time uh, before the widespread availability of penicillin in the 1940s. Uh, when antibiotics were introduced, the global population was between 2 and 3 billion, and it's just about tripled since then. And that's not a coincidence. Uh, along with vaccines and sanitation, antibiotics are among the greatest advances in medical history. Now, today we face the very real possibility that this era of easy antibiotic treatment is coming to an end. Uh, the warnings have been around almost as long as antibiotics themselves. So in 1945, in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, uh, Sir Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin, uh, cautioned about the dangers of emerging resistance uh, and his hope that they could be avoided. Unfortunately, this didn't lead to the kinds of efforts that would have averted this crisis. Uh, there have been references to a post-antibiotic era in the scientific literature for decades. Uh, and a 2014 WHO report warned that this is not a future uh, issue. This is a concern for now. We're already seeing complete failures of available antibiotics for a growing number of pathogens. Uh, in 2017, the WHO released a list of 12 priority antibiotic-resistant pathogens. Uh, these represent the greatest bacterial threats to human health, and urgently need increased funding and effort for research and development. But that first tier represents bacteria that are, that are mostly active in clinical settings, while the second and third cause more widespread disease. And this list doesn't include other pathogens, including non-bacterial organisms that have important and well-described problems uh, with multiple drug resistance. So you see it, of course, in HIV and malaria and TB. We can characterize resistance, or multiple drug resistance, by how many antimicrobial agents an organism is no longer susceptible to. Uh, organisms are considered multi-drug resistant if they're not susceptible to at least one agent in three or more antimicrobial categories. Uh, extensively drug resistant organisms are only susceptible to agents in one or two remaining categories, so there is almost nothing left in the treatment. Pan-drug resistant organisms are not susceptible to any uh, available antimicrobial agent. Now, these categories contain successively smaller proportions of all organisms, and very few strains today are actually pan-drug resistant. Uh, in theory, selection pressure for resistance is balanced by the fitness costs of resistance mutations. But nevertheless, the selection pressure is very high, uh, and so these numbers are increasing. So how serious uh, is this? Uh, what, would we, what would a post-antibiotic world look like? Uh, this, is, this is from one high-profile report commissioned by the government of the UK. Uh, and it estimated that antimicrobial resistance could be responsible for up to 10 million deaths a year by 2050. That's more than cancer cases today. Of these deaths, more than half would be in Asia, and the impact on global GDP could be up to $100 trillion. Now, I, I, you should take this with a grain of salt. The assumptions and the methodology behind this study uh, have been questioned, and we need much more research to understand the potential impacts. But even a significantly smaller increase than this, than what you see here, uh, would make antimicrobial resistance one of the most important uh, global risk factors for morbidity, morbidity and mortality over the decades to come. Of course, these impacts aren't just felt or wouldn't just be felt by those who are actively experiencing community or environmentally uh, acquired bacterial infections. Uh, of course, the end of anti effective antibiotics would have drastic impacts on the medical practice. Uh, it would make routine interventions much, much riskier. So decisions around, for example, C-sections, uh, the routine use of antibiotics in childbirth would have to be reevaluated. Uh, also, interventions like joint replacements, organ transplants, and chemotherapy all use antibiotics routinely. 
Uh, this would have to change the way that people approach healthcare decisions that would lead to much more risk. Now, of course, uh, broad loss of antibiotic efficacy also implies higher risks for infectious disease epidemics or pandemics. Uh, this uh, is a vision of the, the bubonic plague in Florence in the mid 14th century, and this is a drawing from a passage in Boccaccio's uh, Decameron. Uh, the so called Black Death killed up to 60% of Europeans at the time, uh, at least 75 million people, some estimate up to 200 million. Uh, it took several hundred years for global populations to recover uh, at the same levels. Now, so far, multi drug resistance in plague has been very rare. It's not something that, that we see as very likely. Uh, but there have been uh, at least one observed case of multidrug resistance in plague, and it caused international alarm. There's also some evidence of a potential pathway for acquisition of resistance from other bacteria. So this kind of thing is something that we also have to be aware of as we think of this problem. So we're facing a range of multidrug resistant pathogens that threaten our health, if not our whole way of life. Uh, now how did we get to this point? Uh, the first thing to recognize is that we often call multiple drug resistance an emerging phenomenon. Uh, in some ways it is, but the problem of resistance has been around for just as long as antibiotics themselves. Uh, the first antibiotics were synthetically derived from toxic dyes in the early 20th century. And the first broadly acting agents, the sulfonamides, uh, were widely used in, uh, in military operations, sulfur drugs. Uh, penicillin was discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming in 1928 and developed as a viable product by 1942, first for the military and then for the general public. And from the very beginning, uh, resistance was a feature, an intrinsic feature of antibiotic treatment. Uh, the blue bars here uh, show the year of introduction for a range of antibiotics and the year when we first observed resistance, uh, in the, where you see the shaded area begin there. Now, um, the just, just to, to be clear, the ends of these bars are not the time when we stop using the antibiotics. It just shows the beginning of resistance. So, of course, we still use penicillin despite the fact that there's widespread resistance. Uh, but even by the time penicillin was introduced, you already had resistance to sulfur drugs. Uh, and this pattern is repeated without fail for all antibiotics over time. Uh, for comparison, the yellow bars represent the introduction and emergence of resistance in anti-malarial drugs. And you see exactly the same patterns. Now, this is a, a big oversimplica oversimplification, of course. You see different patterns in different, different geographic areas. Uh, some drugs retain more efficacy even after resistance uh, begins. Uh, the use of combination therapies or other measures can extend the utility of certain drugs. Uh, but it's still interesting to see that you say, see the same thing every time, no matter what. So when we talk about multi-drug resistance as an emergent phenomenon, we should recognize that it's really just a current manifestation of long operating processes. So MDR is the, the emergence of resistance to an antimicrobial agent in organisms that are already resistant to a range of, of previously common agents, or the transfer of multiple resistances to, to an agent at the same time. Now, in part, this is just historical path dependency. It's the accumulation of resistant traits over time. But it also reflects an intensification of human activity, which leads to much higher selective pressure operating on pathogens in today's world. Um, this pressure naturally favors the organisms that are most able to resist treatment, and resistance can also come from direct transfer of resistance genes. The most important human activities driving the selection pressure are the inappropriate medical use of antibiotics and their widespread use in food production. Uh, the growth and dynamics of human populations are also critical factors, uh, and one factor which doesn't directly affect the emergence of resistance but does affect risk uh, is the void in the discovery of new antibiotics. So first, um, medical use. There are a number of ways in which the use of antibiotics in health systems increases the risk of emergence of multidrug resistance, and you're probably familiar with most of these. Uh, Overprescription, uh, excessively long courses of treatment, inappropriate prescription, uh, for example, for viral infections. It's very common to see antibiotics prescribed for viral infections. Um, each of these increase the level of exposure of the bacteria to selective pressure. Uh, patient behaviors can also uh, promote resistance, for example, when they acquire less effective drugs on their own or inappropriate drugs, or when they fail to complete prescribed courses. Because hospitals bring together vulnerable patients, invasive procedures, and high rates of antibiotic use, they can be particularly fertile locations for the emergence of resistance. 
Now, food systems are also major contributors. Uh, in some countries, in the U.S., uh, about 80% of all antibiotics go to animals, uh, food animals instead of to humans. Uh, and in many cases, there's not that much evidence that they do that much. Uh, some studies have shown that up to 90% of administered antibiotics are immediately excreted uh, and go right into the environment. And there they affect local microbiomes. Uh, resistant organisms can be spread to humans through direct contact or ingestion of infected animal products or indirectly through environmental exposure. Uh, as with all infectious uh, issues, drug resistance is also a function of the number and the distribution of people. So the more people there are, and we've seen the global population, uh, the more opportunities there are for person-to-person -person spread of resistant strains, or for strains to evolve or exchange resistant traits. And with larger populations, uh, strains are less likely to die out because of such stochastic or random variation. Uh, you see this even within health systems, where larger hospitals are more likely to, to harbor resistant strains. Um, of course, as populations age, we normally see higher populations of hospital patients, uh, and therefore more hospital-based or nosocomial infection. Or one factor that's not discussed as often in the case of antimicrobial resistance is the role of urbanization. Uh, but cities now are where most people live. As of about a decade ago, uh, more people lived in cities than in rural areas of the world. Cities concentrate people together. They lead to un unique networks and contact patterns between people. Urban dwellers have far more opportunities for interpersonal reactions uh, than rural dwellers. Cities also imply different relationships with animals and animal products. Uh, in, in Asian cities, it's not uncommon to see, uh, for example, urban markets where humans and livestock are in close contact over long periods of time. Uh, urban dwellers may be exposed to more and more concentrated environmental pathogens, for example, in human waste from sewerage. Uh, urban hospitals are likely to be larger, which, as I mentioned, tends to promote the emergency resistant strains. Um, urban demand also structures the structure, also determines the structure and function of food systems, uh, even very far away from the city. So, for example, city dwellers tend to demand and eat more meat, uh, and, and this demand underpins the factory farming techniques. Uh, and the conditions that involve broad application of antibiotics to livestock production. Uh, one major issue that increases the risks associated with MDR emergence is the almost complete lack of major new antibiotics in recent decades. So in the, in the first quarter century after the release of penicillin, a whole range of new compounds were found. Uh, this was mostly through systematic screening of, uh, screening of natural products. Uh, since then, there's been a void in discovery. And in part, that's because those were the easy wins, the low-hanging fruit. Uh, and there's a process of diminishing returns, and you continue to ask the same questions. In part, it's also because the typical usage of antibiotics creates unusual financial incentives for pharmaceutical companies. Uh, unlike most drugs or medicines, antibiotics lose value the more they're used. Uh, they're also generally cheap and prescribed over short periods, just a few days, uh, compared with many drugs for chronic illnesses, which are expensive. Uh, it could be taken over years, over a lifetime. So when you look at all these underlying factors, uh, it, it becomes clear that antibiotic resistance fits the profile of what we call systems problems. Uh, and these are our main focus at UNUIGH in the context of urban health. And these problems are characterized by complexity. Uh, they involve multiple stakeholders operating at multiple scales. Uh, they cross sectors. They're related to uh, other complex problems, and, and most importantly, they resist change. So the things that, that you do to change them often don't work. Uh, you often create new unintended problems uh, through your action. We see all of these in the emergence of multi-drug resistant organisms. So, so whose actions are responsible for, for this issue? Uh, of course, it's, it's the pharma companies, but it's also the hospitals, it's also the doctors, it's also the patients. Um, it's also the farmers, it's also the food distributors, the food marketers, and the food processors. Uh, it's the, the people who, who design sewage treatment plants, the people who design cities. Uh, it's, it's consumers, because the problem is related to what we choose to consume and how to produce. Governments at local and national scales and intergovernmental systems are responsible for the laws and the regulations that frame all these issues. So to resolve this kind of problem, and, and all problems of, of, this, of this type, we have to figure out how all these interconnecting pieces fit, and that requires new approaches to research and action. 
The first part of this is recognizing that complexity drives outcomes through the operation of feedback loops. Uh, here you have a very simple diagram of part of the system that drives the emergency resistance. When you have a high incidence of serious bacterial infections, you prescribe antibiotics in order to reduce that incident, reduce that incidence, and that's a balancing or negative feedback loop. When incidence increases, so will prescriptions, and that will bring incidence back down. The problem is that that loop, which makes perfect sense, is tied to another loop. So the more prescriptions you write, the more evolutionary pressure there is on your bacteria, the more abundant resistant strains will be. And this leads to a greater incidence of serious infections, more uh, prescriptions, and even more serious strains. This is a reinforcing or, or positive feedback loop. And in a way, the dominance of this loop describes the whole history of the emergence of, of resistance. Uh, this connected structure that we see here, one balancing feedback loop connected to one dominant uh, reinforcing loop, is something that we see all sorts of places. So not just uh, infectious disease. It's become known as the fixes that fail archetype, systems archetype. And you can use this archetype to show, for example, why building roads doesn't reduce traffic, or why building uh, levees to control floods actually leads to worse floods, or why buying a, a new credit card doesn't actually reduce your debt. There's lots of things that you can use this archetype to show. Um, of course, you can also visualize the impact of external factors, like the inappropriate use of antibiotics or the use in livestock production, both of which feed into this basic system. Uh, the point here is that we can't understand these problems without, without accounting for the systemic feedbacks. And it doesn't need to be very complex. This is a very simple figure. It doesn't need to be so complex to lead to valuable insights. The second major point is that we have to recognize the importance of inter- and transdisciplinary engagement when we work with complex systems. Um, by interdisciplinary, I mean engagement between specialists or between academics in different disciplines, in different fields. By transdisciplinary, I mean engagement with other sectors of society that don't necessarily think in terms of disciplines at all. So the civil society and the government and the, the private sector. This is you now a substantially more complex representation of the system that drives the emergence and spread of antibiotic resistance in Southeast Asia. Uh, the key here is that several very different sectors uh, are involved. And people working in these sectors are unlikely to be able to see the whole system or to influence each other. Uh, neither doctors nor water treatment managers are likely to know much about animal husbandry. Uh, and they don't often talk to those who are involved. Neither farmers nor agricultural scientists are likely to know much about hospital or sewerage design. Uh, to see the system and come up with real solutions, you need to break out of the silos that you're in. Uh, you can do that through purposeful, broad processes of engagement. So problems like this cannot be solved by the health center. That, that's the key takeaway. Uh, they have to be solved through engagement. As someone coming from a public health background myself, I, I think I'm safe saying that in many cases, it's the health sector that's the hardest sector to convince of this need for, for cross sector engagement. Uh, and that's something that we need to work on. So systems methods to recognize and analyze complexity and broad processes of engagement are the two fundamental elements of systems approaches. Uh, they allow us to characterize feedbacks, identify leverage points for action, forecast outcomes, and simulate the results of policies. They also allow us to improve communications, assess the feasibility of interventions, and promote ownership among the stakeholders who, who use the intervention. So what's the solution to the issue of the emergence of multi-drug resistant organisms? Uh, the, the, the system's lens, uh, when we apply it, tells us that there is no one solution. Rather, we're going to have to approach it in many different ways, mediated by many different actors uh, at the same time. It also shows us in that simple reinforcing feedback loop that we saw that resistance is an intrinsic feature of, of antibiotic use. It's not a side effect. It's part of the part of the cycle. It's part of the system. As long as we have uh, as long as we have the latter, we'll inevitably have the former. So while developing new antibiotics is certainly a critical part of our approach, uh, we have to recognize that using them keeps the cycle spinning. Uh, so we need a parallel effort to be effective stewards of stewards of our antibiotic resources and to try to reduce the systemic factors that increase selective pressure on microorganisms. Fundamentally, we need to reduce the relative rate of emergence of resistance uh, below the relative rate of development of new therapies, permanently and sustainably. We'll have to think systematically and improve our collective ability to anticipate and react. Uh, we can do this by improving our mechanisms for cross-sectoral communication and real engagement, by highlighting the feedback loops that drive system behavior through effective narratives, and by changing the fundamental incentives for actors involved in 
the system to promote right and correct actions. If we can do these things, I believe we can find solutions to this and the other complex problems of our times. And I will end on that note. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jose Siri. In fact, multi-resistant organisms are not susceptible to multiple causes of antimicrobial agents. Emerging threat of multi-resistant organisms can result in increased morbidity and mortality in prolonged hospital stays and many are readily transmitted in the healthcare environment. That's truly a great issue that we should concern in healthcare professions. Thanks again for highlighting this issue. I believe our dearest delegates are aware that we, as healthcare personnel, work in an environment where contact with patients or infected material from patients is routine. Healthcare personnel are at risk for exposure to vaccine-preventable diseases and transmissible to patients, young families, and other healthcare workers. Vaccination programs are therefore an essential component of infection prevention and control. Next, you would like to invite Prof. Dr. Zambari to deliver a message on vaccination among healthcare workers and the importance in infection control in healthcare settings. Uh, uh, all of you medical students from uh, uh, various countries, so I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to uh, this uh, very important conference. Today I'm going to talk about a different uh, perspective of uh, infection control, which is uh, vaccination among uh, healthcare workers. Uh, healthcare workers, by the way, include uh, medical students as well, all students, uh, not only medical students, physiotherapy students, nursing students, all students uh, included. And uh, how uh, uh, it evolves in uh, nutrition control uh, in healthcare. This is a, a list of uh, uh, infections that is um, preventable by a vaccine, which includes uh, influenza, hepatitis B, ptosis, uh, measles, uh, mumps, rubella, and so on. And you can see that um, uh, the nosocomial transmission, which is the hospital uh, infection, um, is quite frequent uh, among influenza, hepatitis B, and uh, pertussis, as well as measles. Uh, so um, these are potentially uh, pre preventable diseases, and therefore uh, we as healthcare workers should uh, take note that uh, we should get ourselves uh, uh, vaccinated. We would like to highlight a few diseases to you uh, on the importance of uh, infection control. Um, the first disease is influenza. As you know that a uh, long time ago, about uh, this is 100 years ago, whereby 50 million people died because of uh, pandemic influenza. I'm talking about pandemic influenza. Uh, at the time, was uh, there was no antibiotic, uh, post uh, pre-antibiotic uh, uh, era. Uh, whereby antibiotic was used to uh, treat complications of influenza, uh, notably a bacterial infection, and and therefore many people died uh, then. And also, um, I'm not sure whether you, you know about this H1N1, which occurred about uh, 10 years ago, um, which is another pandemic, uh, whereby Thousands of people died uh, because of H1N1, and the Malaysia is also affected uh, through this. Uh, influenza, talking about seasonal influenza now, um, it is also a quiet host in a, a hospital setting. As you can see, there are a lot of uh, publications uh, telling us that uh, influenza um, infection among healthcare workers is very common, and it occurs frequently. And this influenza is spread through uh, droplets uh, primarily, and as well as uh, droplet nuclei. It depends on the diameter of the uh, uh, 
what you call that droplet. If it is less than five micron and it is therefore airborne, you can easily spread it uh, uh, at a wide area. Whereby it's more than five micron, then it is uh, true droplets and easily it can be transmitted through contacts as well as uh, indirect contacts uh, through bed, uh, hand and surface. And this virus is shattered 24 hours before on stem onset. And um, what makes it more difficult is that uh, the 20 to 50 percent of the infected healthcare workers uh, were asymptomatic. And we should uh, also realize uh, some of the hospitalized patients are too young to receive vaccine and unable to mount protective immune response. And hence, um, the importance of giving uh, or taking influenza vaccine for this particular group of patients, uh, I mean, uh, uh, healthcare workers. Uh, this study was done in the University of Virginia Hospital over 13 seasons. And they noticed that if um, uh, the, there is an increase in vaccination rate among healthcare workers, the uh, nosocomial influenza um, here reduced uh, substantially. Uh, from 32% to 3%. And uh, this uh, highlights the importance of the vaccine. But uh, having said that, everybody knows that the vaccine works and will be able to prevent nosocomial infections. But if you look at this slide, the coverage of vaccination against influenza is really uh, not that good uh, in many countries, uh, with exception of uh, some countries such as uh, Qatar and uh, some in, in France, they have good uh, coverage, but the other countries are not so good, including uh, Malaysia. So the challenge here is how to convince our healthcare workers to take the vaccine. And <clears throat> um, they, there are some determinants that have been studied uh, by uh, certain researchers on how to increase uh, influenza vaccination uptake. And number one is to make them believe that vaccine is effective um, sh should not be a problem. We normally uh, are convinced that uh, vaccination is effective. And uh, we have less adverse events uh, and, and influenza is a serious disease and willingness to prevent influenza transmission. Even though having said all this, we are convinced it is effective, we are convinced there is less adverse events and it's a serious disease, but uh, somehow uh, the uptake is not that good. So, hospitals um, have policies on how to increase influenza vaccination rate. For example, uh, giving free vaccines, or they have on-site vaccination, they have mobile vaccination cards, which is uh, some of the nurses they go to from wards to wards and go direct to the doctors or uh, nurses and the students and give them uh, on-spot vaccination, or sometimes walk-in vaccinations, educational materials, communication campaigns, and uh, if, of course, uh, some of them decline to take the vaccines, they have to sign a uh, declination form. But what is more interesting is in, in some countries, if you are not taking the vaccine, you have to wear mask when in contact of patients. So people know where, who, who are the ones who have not taken the vaccine. And even worse, um, the man mandatory flu vaccination with employment tech termination, meaning if they don't take the vaccine, you are terminated. So these are some of the things that uh, efforts has been done to increase the, the flu uptake. So the next disease is measles. Measles is a very, very infectious disease. And one person can infect 18 others. So um, the, the, the thing about measles is the complications. And complication can kill, it can uh, pneumonia, it can get neurological infections, and therefore vaccination is very important. In this case, there is a, a, a report of a nosocomial measles outbreak in Italy uh, in uh, last year, uh, and they, they see that, um, as you can see here, uh, this is the source, this is a healthcare worker. Um, Sorry, this is the source. Healthcare worker is spread to uh, seven other people here, and it spread further to six people, and it spreads further in the emergency department. So, as you can see, that uh, measles really is a very uh, infectious uh, 
uh, disease. And looking at the uh, looking at the uh, um, how many uh, people are protected, uh, some, because some of them say that uh, they have been vaccinated, but uh, they do surgical studies and found that about uh, 93 percent of them have uh, are immune to measles. So this the, the remaining seven percent, in fact, can also spread the measles to to other um, uh, uh, patients. So this measles, um, because uh, most of us has been vaccinated when we are young, there is an issue of whether is it necessary to give or not to give. So the hospital has to weigh uh, the factors whether they want to do surgical screening or not. Because if you um, if, uh, decide to vaccinate everyone, that will incur costs. Uh, as you can see there, that uh, maybe about seven to ten percent are not that protected because of the dwindling uh, antibodies. So um, there is a need to probably discuss uh, about this at the hospital level, which is more cost effective, uh, including in Malaysia. Uh, this is a study in uh, Malaysia looking at uh, herd immunity against measles in a health district. Uh, you can see uh, that. Um, uh, adolescents and young adults, about 74%. So maybe there is a need to just concentrate on young doctors or young nurses or young students uh, based on this data. And also uh, probably a pre-employment screening and mandatory vaccination for those who are not protected. The next disease is hepatitis B. As you can know that uh, hepatitis B is a long chronic uh, disease and can cause uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, Malaysia also is uh, a part, uh, is quite endemic uh, in Malaysia, but uh, this data um, uh, actually should be uh, yellow in color, because around 5%. This is the schedule whereby the first dose was given uh, at birth uh, and uh, a second dose one month later and the uh, third dose was given six months after the first dose. And there is an issue whether a uh, booster is really necessary or not. Um, and after much debate and uh, so on and so forth, and it was decided that uh, there is no need for a booster unless you are working in a high-risk uh, environment. So this, um, um, just to show you a research article on uh, whether booster is not necessary or not on this school-based study in Hong Kong, whereby there were 38 students when they did uh, uh, screening, they found that 68.4% uh, had protection against uh, HPS, uh, I mean H hepatitis B with the presence of anti-HPS, and the remaining 30% did not have antibodies. So what, uh, sorry, the other way around, this is no antibodies, um, and 30% uh, were protected. So these 70% were given booster, and um, after uh, six weeks of uh, booster, um, almost all of them actually responded to the vaccine. And uh, the three years follow up for those who have responded to the vaccine, and it comes back to um, around this figure, whereby only 70% at, uh, uh, sorry, it's not that. 30% um, did not, uh, they responded, but the antibodies has um, gone down to 30%. So that's, you can see that there's a during um, antibody level, uh, even though they were given booster. But uh, looking at laboratory uh, uh, work and so on, uh, there is um, uh, the theory called uh, memory cells, whereby uh, even though those who have undetectable hepatitis B antibodies, once they were exposed to hepatitis B virus, they were able to mount the antibody um, immediately. Another disease, pertussis, which is also a very infectious disease, can occur to healthcare workers, whereby um, it occur mainly in uh, during uh, when they're exposed to pertussis uh, patients. Uh, presenting at uh, emergencies, as uh, in this case. And the uh, vaccination for uh, pertussis is very simple. They were given 
the first dose at uh, maybe second month, June, uh, third month, and followed by second dose four to six weeks later, and the third dose six to twelve months. And they should be given booster doses every ten to twenty months, which is not the uh, routine thing to do here in uh, in Malaysia. The next disease is uh, varicella zoster, which causes uh, varicella, uh, and or you can call it uh, chicken pox for those who are not uh, familiar. This is a stereotypical uh, um, prevalence of uh, 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 VZV or varicella zoster virus uh, in uh, Southeast uh, Asia, UK, and the US. As you can see, this is this is in. Uh, the one with the round dot is UK. You can see that um, the zero prevalence is very high at the young age. Compared to those uh, at the center here, um, the triangle black dots and uh, the, uh, the square dots uh, from Malaysia and the Philippines, um, at the, uh, 20, in the around the 20 years of age, the zero prevalence is not that uh, great uh, when you compare to those in the Western countries. So that actually poses a problem because when you get um, chicken pox at the later age, it will be more severe compared to those in the UK as well as in, uh, in, in the US. Right? Um, uh, there's a study about uh, varicella zoster virus zero prevalence among healthcare uh, workers uh, in Malaysia, and um, it is found that about uh, about uh, fifteen percent were zero negative. So that is uh, quite high. So again, for chickenpox uh, virus, the hospital has to decide whether they need to screen first and then vaccinate, or they just go for vaccination straight away because there is cost implication if you screen first then you need to add in the cost of screening as well as uh, the vaccination uh, if you just vaccinate you might over vaccinate so that uh, uh, the uh, hospital has to decide whichever uh, particular uh, strategy they want to implement so to sum up, uh, this is the WHO position papers on immunization of healthcare workers. So these are the um, diseases that require recommended to get vaccination. Uh, as listed here, um, you can see if you can, you can read it. And uh, on uh, conclusion, um, protection against uh, healthcare workers is actually crucial. Uh, uh, through immunization in order to prevent possible transmission and even say even though that we know that this is crucial the challenge now is how to increase the vaccine coverage among uh, healthcare workers so that is uh, the end of my presentation thank you very much for your attention Thank you, Professor Dr. Zabri. Uh, I wish all the attendees gain benefit and some take home messages and from the speech delivered by Professor Dr. Zabri. So, dear delegates, uh, just for a quick revision, uh, if there is a diagnosis of bacterial infection, so what's the most common medication that will first come into your mind? Anyone want to answer? Okay, we'll leave this question later. So antibiotics are medicines. So that's the answer is antibiotics. So it's antibiotics are actually a medicine used to prevent and treat bacterial infections. So however, antibiotic resistance is rising as one of the biggest threats to uh, global health today. So it occurs naturally, but misuse of antibiotics in humans and animals is accelerating the process. So let us pay attention to the and to listen to our last speaker, Professor Dr. Sashila, to give. Uh, to share her points on a view of uh, superbug, antibiotic resistance, and stewardship. Please welcome. Okay, a very good uh, morning to everyone. So I'm Sashila, one of the ID physicians from University of Malaya. 
IT physicians from University of Malaya, and I'm here to talk about antibiotic resistance stewardship. So I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and choosing this topic because it's a very important topic. And before I start, I just want to apologize that there might be some overlap in slides, so please bear with me. So that's University of Malaya. For those of you who have never been to University of Malaya, that's where I come from. And uh, I'll start my talk. So I'm not going to dwell on this, as Dr. Jose has already said. Antibiotic penicillin was first um, accidentally actually discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928 when he found in his petri dish there was an area that the bugs were being killed because there was a mold there which they named penicillin. In 1939, Howard Florey and Ernest Chain, an Australian and German um, uh, um, scientists, they isolated penicillin from penicillin and that's how uh, and they started using it in animal experiments and in 1943 it was used in uh, the soldiers and it was known as the miracle drug. Since then penicillin was became the primary treatment for pneumonia, diphtheria, syphilis, gonorrhea, scarlet fever and many other bacterial infections. As Dr. Jose had already said before, in his warnings, in his Nobel Prize presentation speech in 1945, he did warn the public, uh, the people, that antibiotics could develop resistance if they were not used properly or underdosed. Unfortunately, his warning has not been heard by us, and now that has been a reality. And antimicrobial resistance is a problem worldwide. And in fact, Margaret Chan said that the world is on the brink of losing our miracle drug if we keep on at the way we're going. So what are these drugs that they're talking about? So there's this, it's known as ESCAPE, the acronym. These are enterococcus, which is resistant to vancomycin, the MRSA, Clepsilla, which is an enterobacterial C, and E. coli, which is resistant to third generation cephalosporins or broad spectrum cephalosporins, your carbapenem resistant uh, enterobacterial C, Acinotobacter, another gram negative that is commonly found in hospitals, which is resistant to carbapenem, and Pseudomonas, another gram negative in hospitals, which is resistant to multi drug resistant and enterobacter. So they were called the escape organisms because they were escaping the effects of the commonly used antibiotics and, you know, it, and it was not working anymore. Unfortunately, this multi-drug resistant organism is a global problem. So you have it all over the world, these escape organisms. The only thing, the proportion may differ from one country or one continent to another. So other than the escape organism, in the recent years, we have started seeing the emergence of more resistant bugs and uh, carbapenem resistant enterobacterial is one of them. So carbapenem was the drug that we go to when we encounter a multi-drug resistant organism. It has a broad spectrum beta-lactam, beta-lactam is drug. And as you can see, actually in 1990s, uh, uh, one of the, so the carbapenems, there are different kinds depending on the enzyme that they produce. So the KPC variant was already in America, in, as you can see here in this black, the black ones, in 1990s, but it only came to Singapore, as you can see, in 2010. It took a very long time to come. But this was a new variant in 2008 from India, which is known as the New Delhi Metallobetalactamase, which emerged in 2008. And within three years, in 2010, it was found in, in, in Singapore. And we saw it in Malaysia, in our hospitals, in 2013. So, what is so great about CRE? CRE differs from other multi-drug resistant organisms because we don't have any proper treatment for it. There's no reliable treatment. We just give whatever we think that may work and still the mortality is high. And we use cholestine as a treatment. As you know, it's a very toxic drug. And we are, when I used to present this slide, I used to think like, could this get even worse? And unfortunately, yes. So the drug that we use to treat this CRE is cholestine, and now we're seeing cholestine resistant. And as Dr. Jose had mentioned this just now about the different kinds of multi drug resistant organisms, this is what we call a pan drug resistant. That means there's no known antibiotics for this cholestine resistant. It is seen worldwide in humans and animals, and we've seen a couple of cases here in Malaysia. So, how does this resistance develop? I think Dr. Jose has already said. So, antibiotics cause resistance, use of antibiotics cause resistant uh, selection pressure. 
So you know in our body there's, more, there's a lot of bacteria. We need the bacteria, and the bacteria are more than, than the, our, our cells in our body. We need this bacteria to survive, and most of them are sensitive. We may have a few which is resistant because of spontaneous mutation. But when someone takes an antibiotics for whatever reason, the sensitive bugs get killed off. The E. coli in your urine, the sensitive one go off, your, your, your staph on your skin gets killed off, and now you start having multidrug resistant organisms. And these multidrug resistant organisms will now start replicating and become the predominant organism. So this is known as selection pressure. And when a person gets an infection now, it's due to a multidrug resistant organism. The other way resistance is transmitted is by the gene from the resistant bug jumping onto the um, sensitive bug due to plasmids and other mechanisms. So this is how resistance happens. So for example, this is a, you know, you can go to see that uh, CDAP and you can get graphs of how your country is doing with results to multidrug with, with, with multi resistant organisms. So I chose one, this is Klebsiella pneumonia. And as you can see here, in developing countries such as India, Malaysia and South Africa, you can see the resistance rate to Klebsiella to uh, your cephalosporins, your third generation cephalosporins, that's the one in blue, is high. All right? Much higher than that in Australia or United Kingdom and United States. And because of that, we call that ESB are producing organisms that are resistant, resistant to, um, to uh, uh, your third generation cephalosporins. We start giving a lot of carbapenems, and this selects out carbapenem resistant organisms and propagates its spread. And finally, it causes increase in carbapenem resistance, pseudomonas, acinetobacter, and enterobacteriaceae. So, back to this graph, you see now the, even the green bar, carbapenem resistance is high. So if you have an ESBL high, carbapenem will be the next thing that's high, compared to the developed countries, which have low rates of organisms. So this is what you mean by selection pressure. You just start the wheel and it goes all on and on if you don't do something about it. It's quite obvious as a temporal, relation, temporal relationship between the antibiotic use and the amount of resistance that happened. So this was a good paper, but published in 2004 in Aberdeen, showing that there was a temporal relationship between fluoroquinolones, uh, your third generation cephalosporins, and macrolides, and the development of MRSA. There was a lag period of a few months, but as you use more antibiotics, more MRSA came about. This is another slide from uh, a presentation, or uh, a graph from, from WHO, showing antibiotic use and its relationship with antimicrobial resistance from 1990 to 2000 with selected countries. And you can see the countries that use less penicillin had lower rates of penicillin resistance step compared to those countries that use high rates of uh, penicillin and they had less resistance, uh, more resistance. So more antibiotics, more resistance. Similarly, if you use more carbapenems, there is a 15-fold increase in the risk of carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae. If you use broad-spectrum cephalosporin, there is 30-fold increase in ESBL producing organisms. Another interesting meta-analysis showed that these, after you take an antibiotic, the resistant bug will persist in you for at least a year. So even if you decide to stop and say, oh, I did a big mistake by having antibiotics for dengue fever, it's too late for one year, the resistant bug is going to be in your gut. I'm not going to go through how, how, how we go about it. I think that was already touched upon. And, but I just want to tell you that the impact on antimicrobial resistance is great. It's because when you take uh, the, the multidrug resistant antibiotics are difficult to treat, yeah. And there's no standard therapy for it. So, of course, it prolongs illness, it increases the length of stay, they mostly IV antibiotics, they increase cost, and the risk of death is at least two to three times more compared to someone who has a sensitive bug. The worst part is in the current era, we see because of the increase in multidrug resistant organisms, there's increased global, global consumption of antibiotics as well. This, is a, this was, this was um, published in The Lancet showing that. Um, from 2000 to 2010, there's increased use of antibiotics of 36% in 71 countries, and majority of them are from Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And these are all developing countries. And there was an increase of 45% in carbapenem and 13% in polymyxin. So what does that mean? We're going to see more carbapenem resistance, and we're going to see more cholestine resistance in that world. So I think that epidemic and plague that you're talking about might happen. <laughs> the other issue is, as we use more antibiotics for this multidrug resistant organism, 
there's this publication that showed there was also shortage of this broad spectrum antibiotics. There was shortage of cephalosporins, aminoglycosides, penicillins, and beta lactam, beta lactamase antibiotics. So, multi drug resistance antibiotics and multi drug resistant organisms are going up. We're using more antibiotics. And on top of that, there's shortage of antibiotic in production. So, what does that mean? Many of our patients are going to die, isn't it? So, and on top of that, and Jing has mentioned earlier, the number of antibiotics that are being researched and produced is also reduced. So as you can see, in 1990, there was at least 18 antibiotics that was being researched. But now you see in 2010, there's only four. So as antibiotic resistance go up, the number of antibiotics that are being approved is coming down. So we are probably heading to the end of the so-called miracle drug, our antibiotics, and we're going into the pre-antibiotic era, I would say. So how did we get here? Okay, this is the road of, the Bolivian road of death. We are almost there, I think. Resistance will develop, you know, as, as, as uh, Dr. Jose has said, it will develop because it's a natural mutation of, of any organisms. They will mutate even if you don't give them antibiotics. But you can see here, when we get penicillin in 1940, the early 1940s, but even before that decade was over, three years and penicillin resistance was already seen. I mean, uh, when we get methicillin, methicillin, you see MRSA already developed within that decade. Similarly, when keftrexone was given, we see ESBR producing organism. When carbapenem was given, you see carbapenem producing organisms. So you give an antibiotic within about a couple of years, resistance will come. I've never seen one antibiotic that you can say there's no resistance. Right? So, so what has led to this increasing rate of antibiotic resistance? Of course, this is due to antibiotic selection pressure that I told you about. It is because of, mis of, of, in, of misuse of antibiotics and overuse of antibiotics in humans, in aquaculture, agriculture, and animal husbandry. It's because we're traveling more now, and also medical tourism. So pe people go from one country to another. It's difficult for us to get in, isn't it? You need a visa. You need to buy a plane ticket. It's expensive. The bugs, it's easy. They can just come over without any of this. So that's why the bugs are traveling faster than us. They even go, you know, birds also carry them over the borders. And that's how our multi-drug resistance are happening. The other thing is poor infection control. And in developing countries, unfortunately, where the antimicrobial resistance rate is high and we are poor, infection control is even poorer. It's very, very bad, like even the simple thing as washing hands. And this propagates the spread of multi-drug resistant organisms. How are antibiotics misused in, in uh, humans? If it's given when it's not needed, I'm an ID physician, as I told you. And we found that at least 80 patients, 80% 80 of the patients that we see in our, in our get admitted had an antibiotic by day two of their fever from their GPs. Delayed in critically ill patients, it's given at a wrong dose, wrong drug, given too long, it is not de-escalated to a, to a proper drug when, to the targeted drug when, when the res culture results come out, and misinterpreting cultures. As you all know, we are colonized. Urine may have E. coli, but you don't have the symptoms, but you get treated unnecessarily for colonization and you don't have an infection, and that's what causes resistance. It is estimated that 30 to 50 percent of antibiotics is misused in healthcare, and in food industry, it's given for non-therapeutic regions to fatten up the cows and chickens, and also as prophylaxis due to poor uh, animal farming. So this is a nice graph that has shown how medicine has evolved. It's it shows the antibiotic use for upper respiratory tract infection and diarrhea in low and middle income countries. As you know, acute infections such as this is due to viruses and they don't need an antibiotic. But you can see from the top, top graph, graph, it is for treatment of acute diarrhea. And you can see here, unfortunately it's not working, but the percentage of diarrheas which are treated with anti-diarrheal is really low, and ORS is not, but it's also quite low, whereas the use of antibiotics has increased. And if you look down here at upper respiratory tract treatment, you can see in these low and middle income countries, people are not using cough syrups anymore, that is becoming less, but everyone is using an antibiotic for a viral infection. So that's why the resistant rates in India, you saw how high it is, we have seen patients of Malaysian patients come back from India with super duper resistant organisms because they get all sorts of antibiotics which are crazy. So we really need to be careful with what we do. So there are many uh, literature out there or, or, or results, but I picked some that showed in Malaysia that inappropriate antibiotic is high. It's shown in hospitals that antibiotic 
inappropriate antibiotic can go up to 50%. And also in GPs, this was a nice publication in 2016 done by, um, by, the, by USM. They did a cross-sectional study looking at antibiotic prescribing on GPs. And it showed you, for URTI, 50% of them get an antibiotic. And another study looking at the knowledge, attitude, and perception of GPs found that 21% of these GPs will give antibiotics to their patients if their patients demanded for it, even though they thought the patient shouldn't have it. So this is how we are, this is how we are heading to it. So I think there's a lot that we need to improve. And what is the impact of inappropriate antibiotic use? It is mortality. If you look at this graph, the initial, if, if the patient gets an initial inadequate antibiotic therapy, which is in the blue bar, the mortality is much higher than if they get a, uh, the right initial antibiotic, which is in the yellow bar. And this doesn't matter whether the patient has a bloodstream infection or pneumonia or the patient has severe sepsis. If they get the right antibiotic, the chances that they survive is right. So how can we improve ourselves? So WHO came up with this option for action in 2012 and it gave a six-point policy package. Surveillance of antimicrobial resistance, rational antimicrobial use, antimicrobial use in animal husbandry, infection prevention, fostering innovation, and political commitment. So antibiotic stewardship, that's what I'm supposed to talk about, is the rational systemic approach to the appropriate use of antimicrobials in order to maximize the benefit of antibiotic, meaning maximize the cure of the patient reducing mortality and decreasing morbidity, and reducing the unintended consequences of antibiotics, such as antibiotic resistance, length of hospital stay, and side effects. So basically, it's a glorified name for good antibiotic use or smart antibiotic use. So what are the five Ds of good antibiotic use? One is diagnosis. As doctors, it's very important for if you want to give a good, the right antibiotic is to design with, of decide the diagnosis, not when a patient comes in with fever straight give an antibiotic. We must know what the fever is due to. Is it because of a bacterial infection? Is it a viral infection? Document your diagnosis and then um, start your antibiotics. And this has been, a, it's been shown that it's a key factor in deciding whether the patient gets the right therapy. The drug, you have to choose the drug based on the site of infection its propensity to cause antimicrobial resistance. So there are certain antibiotics. So you know there are many antibiotics. There's penicillin, there's cephalosporins, there's carbapenems. But certain antibiotics, such as your third generation cephalosporins, like your ceftriaxone, your fluoroquinolones, and carbapenem, have a higher propensity to select out resistance. So it's very important that when you choose an antibiotic, those must not be the first antibiotics that you choose. Always right, give the right dose. Don't underdose the patient. Give the patient the right dose depending on his renal and hepatic function and body weight. Duration of antibiotics should be adequate, not going on forever for 10 days and 14 days. It has to be evidence-based, based on the site of infection and in organism. And de-escalation of what we, come, uh, we call an antibiotic timeout, where we review the antibiotic use at day three based on the cultural results to see whether we can stop the antibiotics, whether we can target it to better antibiotic, and whether we can change the IV to oral antibiotics. And the most important thing for us to make this decision is before you start an antibiotic, you must, must, must take cultures. Very important. Okay? If not, you will never know what you're treating. So IDSA has come up, IDSA is Infectious Disease Society of America, has come up with guidelines on what would be good programs, antimicrobial stewardship programs. The most recent one was updated in 2016. I'm not going to go through all of them, but what they have, this, they have got very good suggestions which most hospitals now actually follow it. One is, of course, coming up with a clinical guidelines. Number two, having pre-authorization. So before a doctor uses broad-spectrum antibiotics like carbapenem or polystine, they must ask the ID physician first. Getting the dose right, getting the diagnosis right, IV to oral, doing the TDM or drug levels for certain antibiotics, and all this uh, these things have been shown to improve uh, or have been suggested by the IDSA. So does antibiotic stewardship work? Meaning that we always believe when a patient has fever, we have to just throw antibiotics at them. But this is telling you, no, you can actually make a decision wisely. Not everyone with fever needs an antibiotic. So does it work? And it does. These are many studies that have done, that have done Okay, and much more than this, you can see that over there, it's the country it was done. You have the authors and what was the intervention. And you can see restriction of third generation cephalosporins, like, just like your cephalosporins, when they restricted it, there was a decrease in gram-negative organisms. 
Similarly, when they reduce gram-negative organisms, your MRSA and cross-spring difficile. And when they reduced the third generation cephalosporin, there was also a decrease in vancomycin resistant enterococcus. So something as just as simple as that managed to reduce multidrug resistant organisms in hospitals. There's also shown that you would think if you don't give an antibiotic to a patient that you're going to get really sick. But, un but contrary to that, it's shown that if you're you have an antimicrobial stewardship program like the ones I mentioned from IDSA. The, the appropriateness of antibiotic use is much higher, three times higher than usual practice. The cure rate is much higher than usual practice and the failure rate is much lower if you use a good antimicrobial stewardship program rather than usual practice where you just dish out antibiotics. The other thing is political commitment and antimicrobial use in animal husbandry is very important to prevent antimicrobial resistance. So this is a gap analysis that was done by WHO looking at what is each country's response to antimicrobial resistance. And it showed that, I mean, you will know you'll be either in Southeast Asia or Western Pacific region under WHO, and you can see the national action plan in most countries were actually less than 50%, even the best of countries. And where we are, it was quite low. And this shows that most of these countries did not take antimicrobial resistance as their priority, though they were doing small things, but they didn't have a national action plan. And many of these families were developing countries that didn't have much funds. I mean, they were thinking of other health things. The other thing that I found that this is an interesting paper was antimicrobial resistance had been associated with uh, uh, well, poor governance and corruption. And this was very interesting. So. They didn't include Asian countries in this. Countries in Europe was, were included in this. And you can see the Scandinavian countries, which actually um, antibiotic use was low, and the excess of antibiotic use was low. The resistance was also low, that was the y-axis. But the Central European and the East European countries on the other side, which used a lot of antibiotics, the resistance rate was high. Here, the x-axis is looking at control of corruption. And if you look at this, the Scandinavian countries, which had low rates of resistance, that's a y axis, that's the Scandinavian countries, the control of corruption was very good. Whereas the Eastern countries, where the corruption rate was high, control rate was high, showed that um, the resistance rate was also high. So, where, you, where would you put your country? Maybe you should put this in your modeling as well, corruption. So, just think about that. So, the last couple of slides. So because of this importance of antimicrobial resistance to human health and animal health and whatnot, Malaysia launched on, the fe on February 2018, Malaysia launched its uh, national action plan, which is a five-year action plan on antimicrobial resistance. It was jointly developed by the agencies under the Ministry of Health and the Agriculture and Agro-based Ministries, and it aims to promote National, rational usage of antibiotics in both humans and animal health because it is, we all know that we are all connected to each other so we cannot ignore one sector from the other. So this is uh, our aim or we're promoting one, or one Health whereby to include humans, animals and the ecosystem in improving antimicrobial resistance. Education, very important. Currently, most countries or developing countries don't have a proper ASP education. Most of the education is targeted on adult professionals. As you can see how our GPs are prescribing, no one is going to change the practice at this age. So it is important, so part of our national action plan in Malaysia is to include antimicrobial stewardship programs in the curriculum and also in extracurricular activities in primary and secondary schools eventually. And also to include uh, antibiotic stewardship curriculum in vet medicine. We also to improve awareness of uh, initiate awareness of antibiotic poor antibiotic use for the public and healthcare workers. Every year, there's an antibiotic awareness campaign celebrated by WHO. That's our mascot. Uh, by, by KKM. That's our mascot. And uh, we also and this is UM's AEW. We also give uh, we go to BFM and various. Uh, you know, radio stations to give and also interviews on TV during this period to, to educate the public. And also there are a lot of posters and our our catchphrase for antibiotic use among the public is Perluka, do you need it? So before you take an antibiotic, ask yourself, 
Do I need it? Perlukah antibiotic? Okay. So, fostering innovation, I think I don't need to touch on this. So, these are the pathogens that uh, Dr. Jose has said is in the critical list and WHO is concentrating on R&D for, for new antibiotics for these organisms. I won't go through this. This is already mentioned that we are facing a bleak future. We, we will probably, um, be, we have to be careful. And uh, the country that would be affected, the, or the continent that be affected most would be in the Asian, Asian region. So just to quote Madam Dame Sally, Davis, she's the UK Chief Medical Officer and very into antimicrobial resistance. She said, antibiotic resistance is a catastrophic threat. We will, our, we will find ourselves in a health system not dissimilar to the early 19th century where organ transplant, cancer, chemotherapy, joint replacement, and even minor, minor surgeries will become uh, life-threatening. And we are already seeing that, I already see that in my practice, and by the time you come out, you will also be seeing probably more than what I am seeing. There are many guidelines out there, international guidelines and local guidelines in Malaysia. You're free to look it up. It's all on the website. It's free. So I would say, I mean, I, we didn't touch on infection control, but the two important things that would curb antimicrobial resistance is uh, antibiotic stewardship, smart antibiotic use of prescribing, and infection control, just washing your hands. And that's what I can tell you on behalf of all doctors, that that is the two most important things that would save your patient's life, washing your hands, in fact, more than antibiotic prescribing. So i like to end with this comment. Judicial se selection of antimicrobial is superior, is, a, is the superior solution to changing, uh, to chasing elusive new wonder drugs to compensate for our current profligate use of antibiotics, meaning we, we assume when a new antibiotics come out, and most of I hope this happen, doesn't happen to you, but I do say it. a drug rep brings an antibiotic, they say this is very good, and you immediately use it without thinking. But instead of that, try to go back, think rationally, and choose your antibiotic. It does not mean that if it's new or it's broad, broad spectrum, it's better. In fact, the narrower spectrum antibiotic would be better. We have patients, for example, patients with MSSA bacteremia. The superior drug is actually cloxacillin, and we have patients getting meropenem for it. For what? Cloxacillin is so much more better. So think before you treat. You are doctors, you're not lay people, so please, uh, please think before you treat. So with that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your particular, her degree, and enriching speech. After listening to our speakers, do you have any doubts? No worries, because we have a forum discussion with these three speakers. We shall call upon Dr. Jose Siri, Prof. Dr. Zamari, and Prof. Dr. Sashila to be on stage. To be on stage. Please do not hesitate to ask questions to our speakers as they are willing to answer and clear your doubts. We also provide an online platform for you to ask questions if you feel shy to come forward and here is the link. Now, I would like to pass the microphone to our moderator of this forum, Dr. Sharifah Azura bin Saleh, the Head of Infection Control, Hospital University of Malaysia. Thank you, Dr. Alright, um, Assalamualaikum and good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all speakers for a very enlightening and informative uh, talk. Um, for this forum, uh, question and answer. Uh, is there any question from the floor? <laughs> so, if um, is there a question? All right. Good morning, uh, and first, good morning, thank you, Kurs. So, we, I'm from Group 11. So, uh, my question is, uh, as I understand in Malaysia, uh, the primary care practice, GPs, uh, they don't usually charge consultation fee, or they usually charge very low consultation fee. And the bulk of earnings come from dispensing medications. So, how can we, uh, how to say, have a revamp of the health system such that they won't over-prescribe just for financial gains, which could lead to uh, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, that's my question. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, very good question. Thank you for your question. And it's a very politically driven question. <laughs> so I think uh, it's a good point. I think personally, uh, I believe the prescribing and the uh, dispensing should be separated. Uh, many countries don't do it. Uh, I think there's still dialogues going on between the Ministry of Health, the GPs, and pharmacists regarding this. So uh, I can only tell you my personal opinion. Uh, but uh, there are dialogues going on about how they can uh, separate, separate it out or whether they can or not, and how they can improve, uh, uh, improve things so that there's no financial gains involved in this and dispensing. Okay. Um, any more questions from the phone? Uh, we'll take one from the app. Uh, this is for Prozabri. What is the downfall or complication of over vaccination? Well, um, when, I'm not sure what you mean by over vaccination. Uh, maybe you take a uh, vaccine several times. Uh, let's say you take one once a year. That is the recommendation. You take twice a year, or even more than that. Uh, probably that is what you mean. If that is what you mean, um, in fact, uh, uh, if you read the uh, uh, journals and all that, there are no mention about over vaccination. Uh, vaccination is a, quite a safe uh, means of uh, protecting one uh, against. Uh, preventable diseases and there is actually no harm in taking they say the recommendation is 10 to 20 years but if you take it every five years um, that is not a problem um, that means that you get protection uh, you know uh, consistent protection but uh, uh, probably the only thing I can think of the complication is uh, you have to pay more for the vaccines <laughs> you know, there is some financial implications that that uh, that is what I can think of. Uh, apart from that, in terms of uh, uh, medically, um, it is not advisable, but uh, we should uh, you know follow the recommendations uh, uh, based on whatever evidence that we make. Because um, if you give more vaccines, doesn't mean that that is uh, more effective. In theory, of course, uh, you produce more antibodies, but we don't know that there is no study to to, to look at uh, what happens if you give uh, a lot more vaccines. I wonder if that question is also referring to the vaccination schedule for infants and, and the common complaint that maybe infants are getting too many vaccines at the same time. As far as I understand, all of the evidence says that it's okay. These schedules are developed uh, in ways that protect infants as long as you have healthy children, I'm sure you know how to take more and more vaccines. Um, is there any question from the floor? Yeah, um, this one? Okay. Hi there, uh, I am Anshan from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, my question is, if the mother is resistant, uh, if any mother is resistant, testing, uh, mother is uh, resistant to any infection, uh, if the baby got uh, raised in, how can we manage the baby uh, to survive uh, after birth? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, if a mother, sorry. Yeah, uh, if mother is resistant to any kind of infection uh, or any kind of bacteria or uh, any kind of antibacterial uh, antibacteri agent, 
in the uh, baby got the gene uh, from the resistant antibacterial agent and the baby is infected with that bacteria. How can we treat the baby to survive? Yeah, so I think if I get your question right, thank you for the question, is you, you're saying that the mother's antibiotic-resistant gene will get to the baby. Well, I, I don't think what, what will happen is, so for example, if you, if they just say the mother had uh, E. coli bacteremia, okay, during, is that what you're saying? During her pregnancy, she's got an E. coli, during pregnancy, are you saying? Yeah. During the, and the baby comes out while she's having an infection? Yeah. Or when she touches the baby later? During pregnancy and then she delivers the baby? Yeah. So I know, seriously, I've, I've not heard of uh, infection in utero, but they can get infected if they have amniotic fluid gets infected. So perinatally, if you just say she's pregnant and she's got uh, intrauterine sepsis, all right, then um, of course there is a chance of the baby getting infected at that time. So if the baby gets infected, it's born during that time, you're asking if the baby is infected in the abdomen or once the baby comes up? Okay, so just say she's having the infection while she's going into delivery. Uh, you know, she's got an intrauterine sepsis and it's a multi-drug resistant organism. And the baby comes out and the baby is also infected and has an infection. We also treat the baby with antibiotics. So it's not like something genetically is transferred into the baby's genome. So it's not the baby will have a resistant gene for the rest of his life. So when someone gets acquired with a multi-drug resistant organism, it persists until your own flora starts multiplying and overtakes the resistant organism. But you treat it if you, if you have an infection. Nah. So in this case, if the baby has an infection, we treat the baby. And uh, that's it. Sometimes they don't get infected, they just colonize. Then they're treated as colonization. And we wait for their own uh, bugs to come about. We don't treat colonizers. Is, uh, did I answer your question? Hold on. All right. Um, we have one question here. Uh, should we educate the general public regarding antimicrobial resistance instead of just targeting highly educated people? Yes. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's, it's critical that we educate everybody um, because ultimately the public drives a lot of decisions about what we do and how effective it is by their choice to use things or not use them or on them and so on and so forth. So I think that's absolutely it. And I think that is that is currently being done. So the Pharmaceutical Society (MPS) actually has uh, a body that goes around not only treating educated people, whatever you mean by that. Uh, but if they have a degree and PhD is educated, is that what you say? Okay, can't define education based on that, but even we have people going into villages, pharmaceutical people going into villages, and NGOs actually educating people about this, medical students going in as part of their project. So, uh, yes, the public needs to be educated, all level of public. In fact, I should even say that the WHO has a global action plan for, for combating antimicrobial resistance. I think this is from 2015, and the first general strategy to increase awareness and understanding. So it's absolutely a critical part of the program. All right. Um, is there any more questions from the floor? Okay. Thank you for the lecture. I'm Ritaro Iskawa from Japan. Uh, I have a question about uh, yeah, I have a question about infection. Uh, and there's a lecture about uh, to prevent antibody uh, resistant uh, yeah, um, to to, uh, to prevent antibody resistance. Uh, smart prescribing and clean hand is needed. So, but 
yeah, in Japan, there's few doctors uh, too, so uh, they are, they have enough, they don't have enough time to pay enough attention to uh, prevent uh, infection like that. And yeah, just few doctors whose measure is infectious diseases. How can we uh, solve this problem? Do you, do you think? Thank you. I'm really sorry, the sound system is quite awful. To my aging ear, I couldn't, I, I couldn't uh, understand. Can you sorry, There's a um, lecture to add, 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 add. There's a lecture to prevent antibody resistance. Uh -oh. Maybe, yeah, you, you want to come to the front and use this? Don't be shy. This is a good mic. Uh, thank you for the lecture. And uh, uh, I have a question about infectious diseases. Uh, in Japan, just a few doctors so uh, to. I pay enough attention to infectious diseases like the mass prescribing and being hurt. And just few doctors whose measure is infectious diseases. And so um, it's a very important problem to prevent infectious diseases in hospital. But yeah, uh, it, the number of doctors cannot uh, increase. Um, in, in the short time, so how can we solve the problem of infectious diseases? Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you for your question. You can sit down. But uh, I must say, Japan is a great country. I've met doctors from over there, and we know that your multi-drug resistant rates over there is really, really low. Okay, that's because they have got a good system in place. Culturally, as I told before, the multi-drug resistant organisms are spread because of poor infection control. And culturally, Japan is very, very clean. They're very conscious of what they do. I've met Japanese doctors that have come to our hospital just recently, a couple of months ago. The resistance rate is very low. I don't know because they're isolated in an island, which I don't think so, because Singapore is also isolated in an island and its rates are as high as ours, if not higher. Any Singaporeans here? Sorry about that. I'm sure you should know your rates by now. It's quite high. But Japan, Japan, uh, the rates are very low. And probably that's why infection control and infectious disease you don't need so many doctors because by right, I'm an infectious disease doctor. I treat, um, uh, what you may call it, dengue and HIV and things like that. These are microbiologists. But we go into infection control because infection control is poor. Infection control, do you need to train people to wash their hand? Do I need to tell you wash your hand after you come out from the toilet? No, you should do it as part of what you're supposed to do. When you touch a patient, you wash your hand. You don't need a doctor standing there to tell you what to do. We have a lot of, I have to tell you, we have a lot of doctors here, microbiologists, ID physicians have to do infection control because doctors don't want to wash their hands. The equipment is not cleaned properly. In Japan, culturally, this is done by individually. If individually, each doctor, a surgeon washes his hand, the nurses clean the equipment properly, the environment is cleaned properly and wiped down, then you don't need infectious disease doctors and microbiologists to stand there and audit you and keep scolding you to do these things. So we don't need that in Japan because people consciously and culturally, they do it well. In fact, this I found this amazing was 
if there is an MDRO in a hospital or an outbreak, the doctors stand in front of the public with a media there and bow their heads and apologize to the public for the MDRO in the hospital. Can you see that happening in our country? No. We blame it on visitors when we don't wash our hands. But in Japan, you just Google it up. They bow their heads and they say sorry to the public when there is an MDRO in the hospital. So, back to your question. I think you don't need to worry about too many ID physicians and infection control doctors in your hospital because infection control and good prescribing is not an ID doctor or microbiologist's responsibility. It is every single doctor's responsibility. It doesn't matter whether you're a surgeon or a or an endocrinologist, or a physician, or a gynecologist, every single person should know how to prescribe antibiotics well, and every single person should know how to wash their hands by themselves. Okay, so be changing, be a, change the culture. In Asia, I studied in India, nobody even thought of washing their hands. Even now, when I went back to some hospitals, alcohol-based hand rubs are only there for the consultants. Normal human doctors don't get it. Whereas I also went to Australia and I was in Alfred for a while. If a surgeon does not wash your hands, his contract is not renewed. I was in Alfred for a while. So that's the difference, the cultural difference. And we might go, hopefully we go towards that direction. I hope for that. Um, uh, the WHO uh, proposed that for you to do your hand hygiene within the patient zone. That means within the area we, before you leave the patient zone. So the most effective way is to have each patient zone has their own uh, alcohol hand rub. But as we know, that costs a lot of money. So it is not as uh, easy to implement in a country uh, that has uh, um, resources that is less. All right. Um, next question is for hepatitis B vaccine. Um, what does it mean when one is tested negative for anti-HB after a series of three shots and after a booster? Does that mean the vaccine failed? Right, uh, this question uh, refers to a completion of the schedule, about the DCB schedule. Uh, so it takes about six months and um, you check, there is no antibodies. So you give another shot, uh, booster dose, and then uh, you check again, there is still no antibodies. So what does it mean? But right, uh, um, you know, there are less than uh, maybe about uh, 5% uh, who did not respond to the vaccine, which we call as uh, non-responder. And uh, people are trying to associate what uh, uh, this particular group of uh, uh, subjects or people who do not respond to the vaccine, what are the factors? Some say it's obesity, some say it's uh, genetic, but still now we are still do not know. Um, for this uh, vaccine, uh, they should be given another shot of uh, primary series, the uh, three dose series, before uh, later on we can label uh, that particular person as non responder. Um, the, um, there are now many research on uh, trying to look for alternatives. Maybe they did not respond to the surface antigen, so they're looking for other antigens so, so that uh, this particular group would have uh, uh, ben benefits. Uh, of having hepatitis B uh, protection. Um, for those who did not respond fully to, to these uh, antibodies, so it is uh, unfortunate for them, and uh, therefore they have to take a uh, lot of precaution uh, to prevent themselves from uh, get, uh, getting hepatitis B. So I hope that uh, answers the uh, question. Any questions from the floor? Yeah. Um, uh, one question from the app is how can we control the over-the-counter availability of antibiotics in certain countries? Uh, 
Do we control the availability? Does that mean you limit or increase? <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I think that, that this is a question of country-specific regulation within international frameworks. So the context of different countries will be different. And they're, they're, they want different uh, results in different countries to be based on the local situation. Um, I'm not really sure how else to do it. So, so I think, again, this is part of the National Action Plan. Uh, so uh, if you're talking about Malaysia, you cannot buy antibiotics over the counter. If someone is selling it to you, actually they've done something wrong. And if it's, they're caught, the pharmaceutical company will take care of it. Yeah. So that's what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Ye
Well, I'm not too familiar with CRISPR, C R I. So it's a gene that, uh, thing, uh, tool uh, which is uh, very powerful. Well, in fact, uh, uh, still at research level, um, researchers are trying to look at how to use this tool to edit genes, particularly um, among uh, what they call that uh, organisms, not necessarily bacteria. There's some some are also using it. Uh, for viruses, uh, well, it is an exciting one. Probably in future we can uh, know whether CRISPR really works on uh, targeting uh, bacterial diseases or viral diseases. So that is uh, the best I can answer. Um, any questions from the floor? No. Uh, we have one on uh, MDR tuberculosis. How to give antimicrobial rationality to prevent uh, MDR tuberculosis? This is the main problem over time in Indonesia. So I think first and foremost, when they get tuberculosis, uh, the reason for MDR tuberculosis is because the initial tuberculosis was not treated properly. So the patient didn't undergo DOTS, didn't complete the therapy, or took the medication intermittently. As you know, anti-TB treatment is quite, it's not very pleasant, a lot of side effects to it. So patients tend to be non-compliant. Therefore, that's why there's DOTS therapy, directly observed therapy for, for TB. The patients that generally get resistance is because they don't comply to the treatment regimen. And that's why they develop resistance. So if you want to prevent multi-drug resistant TB, the only way is to ensure compliance. So DOTS must be very, very strict in your country, especially in countries where HIV is increasing. You're seeing an increase in TB. And because of the polypharmacy, there's lots of dropout and we are seeing more multi-drug resistant organic uh, TB. Uh, what was that the question? How to prevent it? So how to prevent MDR TB is to make sure that TB is treated um, uh, the first time when the patient gets TB, make sure they are treated properly so they get the right dose. You know you can you have to calculate the dose for TB, isonize it is five milligrams, refem ten milligrams for KG body weight, and so on and so forth. So you have to make sure the dose is appropriate for that weight, don't underdose. The reason for resistance is when you underdose the patients or doses are missed, uh, that's how resistance come about. So you have to make sure that doesn't doesn't happen to prevent resistance. Uh, any question from the floor? This is a very difficult question to answer. Is it practical to culture all ER patients before giving them antibiotics? Culture usually takes hours and sometimes days. How do you approach this the issue in ED? How we approach an ED is how we'll approach them anywhere else. When a patient comes in uh, to ER, you must first make sure they have an infection. If you think the patient has an infection, it's a bacterial infection, and you're going to start the patient on antibiotics, you must take culture first. You don't take culture unnecessarily. If you take culture, if a patient doesn't have fever, for example, the patient comes in with, I don't know, you, I don't know, Paper pains, you don't need to do a culture for that patient because she doesn't have an infection. What will happen if she grows something, it's actually a colonizer and the doctor is forced to treat. So make sure you first diagnose when the patient comes to ED with shortness of breath and, uh, and cough or whatever. Make sure it is pneumonia and not APO, acute pulmonary edema. We've got patients with acute pulmonary edema getting, a, a getting an antibiotic or getting an antibiotic for an acute MI, I don't know for what. So think first, so if you think the patient has the syndromic approach, as a fever, cough, shortness of breath, you auscultate the lung, there is bronchial breath sounds, chest x-ray shows, then do the sputum culture, send the blood culture, start your antibiotics, day three the culture will come back and you downgrade the antibiotics. That's what you mean by smart prescribing. 
If a patient comes in with shortness of breath, autopnea, PND, pinkish or disputum, looks like an APO, you give less six, and no need to give antibiotics. The problem is, you, some people write down the diagnosis APO and give antibiotics and then ask what should I do about it. So that's wrong practice. Only take cultures if the patient has an infection and you're starting an antibiotic. If you're starting an antibiotic, means you think the patient has an infection. So give start the culture results. If you think the patient has an MI and you still feel you need to give antibiotics, take the cultures anyway. It's bad practice if you have an ID physician, not in Japan, but in Malaysia, if you have an ID physician, they'll probably come and strangle you. Or in, in, in Singapore, I'm sure your ID physicians there are quite garang as well. Uh, so um, it's very important that you first make a diagnosis before you decide on giving an antibiotics. Does that answer the question? Right. Um, we, uh, our time is up, um, so we will conclude our Q&A sessions for today. Uh, can I have a round of applause for the panel? Thank you for your active participation. We would like to invite Ms. Tan Der Shen to hand over the token of appreciation to our three speakers and the forum moderator. Firstly, we would like to thank Dr. Sashila. Thank you, Dr. Zamari. Thank you, Dr. Zamari. Matthew. Next, we would like to thank the forum moderator, Dr. Sharifa. <laughs> Lastly, we would like to thank Dr. Hossein Siri. Enjoy the lunch prepared, and also they are selling Yakult outside the hall. Um, you have, you may have another one. Thank you.